should bring the tools that they have, the innovation they have, to help us make the world a better place. The CEO of Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, discusses the breakthroughs in vaccinations. But is their work immune from the threat of isolationism? Welcome back. You're watching World Insight. I'm Tian Wei. Created in the year 2000, Gavi is an international organization, a global vaccine alliance bringing together public and private sectors with a shared goal of creating equal access to new and underused vaccines for children living in the world's poorest countries. Earlier, I got a chance to sit down with the CEO of Gavi, Seth Berkeley. He shared his experiences in improving vaccination and helping countries to improve outbreak response. These days, when you have so many debates about globalization or not, unilateralism or not, rising of protectionism or not, how much attention really governments have toward the cause that you have? Well, what we're fundamentally trying to do is make sure that every child in the world has access to the basic prevention that vaccines bring. Vaccines have, uh, have amazing power with them, and now we have vaccines against two types of cancer, against diarrhea and pneumonia, the two largest killers of children. Mm -hmm. And this is something at the end that saves money. It saves lives. It makes children live up to their full potential. So this is something that we think should be supported no matter what the other controversies are. However, governments have to be there to be your partner in order to make your things work. But we have seen over the past few years, for example, some of the biggest economies tend to look more inward rather than contributing to the global system. For an organization like yours, what does that mean for your sustainable development? Well, first of all, we've been lucky to have continued support from governments during all of this turmoil that you discussed. But also, we have to think about this not just for the good of the people we're working with, but with infectious disease, if you don't deal with the problem at its, at its location, it can spread. And so we can see waves of epidemic mm -hmm. that affect everybody in the world. So this is not only the right thing to do, but it's also good for even those groups that feel they're only worried about their own populations. But do you think your words are falling into the right ears? Well, we hope so, and one of the things that's important is as we are able to control disease, people see. So, for example, a few years ago, there was a terrible Ebola outbreak that mm. occurred, and it caused uh, 20,000 cases, more than 10,000 mm. deaths. Today, we have an Ebola vaccine. So when the most recent outbreaks occurred in DRC, we were able to roll that out quickly and contain the outbreak right. before it could spread. This is the type of prevention the world needs. Besides the efforts and the actions coming from you, what about those that should be contributing to the cause? Are you looking around and asking those questions? Where are you? Well, we certainly ask that everywhere because we believe that all governments, but also philanthropy, individuals, and particularly corporations, should bring the tools that they have, the innovation they mm. have, to help us make the world a better place. For the work that we do, it's not just about the vaccines. Vaccines don't deliver themselves. So yeah. what we need is a good supply chain. We need a good cold chain. We need to have good data systems. And these are tools that can be brought to bear by the private sector in a win-win model where mm. they open up new, new markets, but at the same time, they use their technology to help. Mm. However, when your cause is being practiced in different countries and different cultures, certainly you have to cater to the needs on the ground and the way how they are doing things. So how are you being flexible and smooth in a way when you face so many different kinds of situations? Well, what's interesting is as a public-private partnership, we take a little bit from both. So we are not the UN. Mm. We take the ability to tailor our approaches in each country. Now, you're absolutely right. If you're working in a country that has a current outbreak going on or has an emergency going mm. on or is war-torn, it's very different from a country that has a stable government and that systems are working. And in some countries, of course, we have problems with corruption and other issues. So for each one of those situations, we adapt our programs to try to meet the needs of the population and also to work with the government to increase their capacity over time. Mm. There's question always about whether vaccine is the way to go. For example, about HIV AIDS. Many have been 
providing information suggesting it would take still a long time before any possible vaccine can be developed. Whether vaccine is the way to go or vaccine is only the way to prevent certain small amount of diseases from spreading around, even though they could be really fatal to most of the population. I don't think that's true. I think for... Of course, they're doing that cause and you wouldn't think so. Well, I'm also a physician and, and prevention is always better than treatment. So that's one critical issue. If we had an HIV vaccine, of course, we could stop the epidemic. We now have treatment, but treatment... Well, if you had, but you didn't have well, right we now, don't have and therefore it was difficult and therefore whatever the resources should be put into the vaccines or put into advocacy or put into a medicine that could eventually cure the disease. That's the priority setting. Well, I think first of all we have no example of a retrovirus being cured. So although that is a wonderful quest and maybe some way we'll do that, today the science isn't there. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the science isn't there for HIV vaccines either. But it would be the tool that would be the most transformational. So today what we do is we provide treatment for people and prevention but you know behaviors don't always change and the treatment is expensive and today a large percentage of people that are that are infected aren't able to access treatment yeah. so this is still a problem and infections are still occurring so about the vaccine debate when they say whether vaccine it should be the priority for different diseases what would you say well, first of all, if it's easy to make a vaccine, it is a great prevention yeah. and it works. And it works to eliminate diseases, it works to control diseases. If the science is difficult, you're absolutely right. You have to prioritize mm. where we are. But I would argue you don't spend 100% of money on, on that, but you also don't spend zero because you'll never solve the problem. Mm. And so the challenge is then how do you set that priority? Common sense prevail, yes. as you said. Yes. The qualities of vaccines, a big subject. What is the general situation, Dr. Berkeley, if you can help us to understand yes. about the qualities of vaccines? I'm talking generally, of yes, course. Yes, of course. So from our perspective, there should be one quality, and that should be a high quality for everyone in the world. Mm -hmm. So we only purchase vaccines that are pre-qualified by the World Health Organization. Now, what does that mean? That means a regulatory authority in a country, a stringent regulatory authority, approves that vaccine, and then WHO does a set of further tests to show it is safe, it's effective, the processes are, are well done. And that is the standard we have. Now, of course, not every country follows those standards. Countries can do what they want. But my argument for countries is to lift up to that standard. Because the problem is when you have a scandal on vaccines, it shakes confidence not only locally, but it shakes it globally. And what we want, this is a very personal thing, vaccinating your newborn baby, mm. you know, and, sure. and the baby cries, of course, with a vaccine. You want to know that that vaccine is safe and that vaccine is efficacious. And that's the game we're in to try to make sure that that's true everywhere in the world. Mm. On the global supply chain of vaccines, uh, Dr. Berkeley, how do you see the roles of developing and emerging economies and that of developed economies, generally speaking? So 15 years ago, we had five suppliers of vaccine. Four of the five were in developed countries. Mm -hmm. Today, we have 17 suppliers, and the majority of them are in developing countries, meeting those standards, including one vaccine supplier in China mm -hmm. who supplies us with vaccines. The, the important thing about this is that the, what we look for is a high volume, low cost model. Yes. Whereas the model traditionally in the West had been low volume and high cost. For manufacturers in developing countries, particularly countries that have large birth cohorts, China, 16 million, India, 27 million, these are large birth cohorts you already have that, that advantage of volume. And of course, mm -hmm. if you start serving other countries, you can get to high quality and, 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 and uh, large volumes. So you do believe that developing countries and emerging economies could be great resource for you Absolutely. in the future? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and we've seen, for example, the five-in-one vaccine that we use. That's, that's not used in China, but it's used in all of our yeah. other countries now. We've seen that price go from about $3.50 a dose now to under 70 cents. Yeah. And that type of trend is what happens when you get multiple manufacturers at scale. You get a competitive marketplace and you see high-quality vaccine at a good price. Mm. 
there have been some misunderstandings or preconceptions by some that emerging economies and developing countries might not necessarily be able to produce as high quality of vaccines as those coming from the developed economies. Is that true? No, I don't believe that at all. Um, I, I think, I mean, if I use the example of China, you know, my iPhone, my iPad were made in China. That quality is a global quality. Every iPad, every iPhone in the world is at that global quality. Of course, countries can make just as high quality, if not higher quality than the others. The question is whether that's the standards they have and whether they invest in doing that. Mm. If they do, um, they can produce, um, you know, better than anybody. Does China do? What, China makes the high quality vaccines? Yes. The, the vaccine that we buy, which is a Japanese encephalitis from Chengdu Biologics, is pre-qualified by WHO and is a high quality vaccine that we're rolling out across countries in Asia. We understand that these days there have been so much debate about health. Each country has their own plans, but how al resources should be allocated? So first of all, when you can, you always prioritize prevention over treatment. It's always better to prevent than to treat. Second is you need to make sure your basic primary health care services are available because that's the vast majority of the population and you can treat most conditions with that. What people tend to do, of course, is when they get sick is they demand expensive hospital care and it's important to have that. But if you only invest in that, you know, the patients will keep coming, they will get more and more expensive and you'll be in a situation where uh, health statistics go down. Mm -hmm. So we need prevention, we need primary health care, and then of course we do need to invest in secondary and tertiary care as well. There's also the issue of how when governments change, priorities tend to shift. And yet for an issue like health, it has to be long-term planning. So I'm sure in the field you have experienced those dilemmas pretty frequently. Of course, what you want is a situation where all sides of the political spectrum, all leaders believe in the importance of, of these uh, critical issues. Right. And then, no matter whether there is change or not, you still have support for the policies that are there. That is an ideal world. Certainly, I spend some of my time going to countries as a leader change, as changes occur in a, in a party where we have to go and re advocate for uh, uh, prevention, but I think this is something that needs to be built into the structure of a country. And remember, at the end, people will, if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. So people will always demand health. And that's why if you have a good prevention and you have a good primary health care system, you're doing everything you can to keep people healthy. From my perspective as a doctor, the ideal world is you live healthy your whole life without disability and then you die in your sleep at whatever age, 95. We're not there, but that's what we want. We don't want somebody who's chronically mm. sick getting worse and worse. So how do we make sure that that's the direction we move towards? It seems that these days, uh, nonprofit organizations such as the Gates Foundation and some of the others, such as Gabby, has been playing much bigger role than some of the most established uh, international mechanism. Many wonder how the picture of philanthropy has been evolving over the years. And now when you look at the debates, as we mentioned at the very beginning of our discussion about globalization, about uh, unilateralism, what it will be like, uh, Dr. Berkeley, I wonder if you ever thought about that future trend. Well, absolutely. So first of all, I mean, I love the philosophy of the Gates Foundation, which is that every life is of equal value. I think that's a very good philosophy. But of course, we still need global normative organizations. We still need companies, and companies are for profit. So mm -hmm. the way Gavi works is we bring all of those groups around the table. So the Gates Foundation sits with WHO and UNICEF and the World Bank. They sit with the pharmaceutical manufacturer. They sit with civil society, developing country leaders, donors. Together, they discuss these things. And therefore, all of these issues mm. are discussed, and we come to a consensus and move forward. That's how we keep this in balance. Very interesting. Thank you so much, Dr. Berkeley, for being with us. All the best. Thank you for Thank having you. me.
And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us, World Inside CGTN, into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Sina Weibo. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Inside team, thanks for watching. Tune in again next time for Insight across China and around the world. Good night.